Majora's Mask Chapter 17 The Temple This is the palace of the Deku Kingdom. Only those on official business may enter. This is the palace of the Deku Kingdom. Only those on official business may enter. The other Deku scrub rolled his eyes, staring glumly at the palace's purple pond. The one on the right, standing proud and tall, looked to the sky mixed orange and blue. He proudly repeated himself. This is the palace of the Deku kingdom. Only those on official business may enter. Ah, please, shut up. The one on the left side, paying no attention to actually guarding the front entrance, Hardly anyone ever came down that rickety wooden bridge anymore. I have to be prepared for the next commoner, the right one said anyways. His Royal Highness will not stand for mediocrity. His Royal Highness doesn't care how we greet our commoners, the other Deku scrub replied. He wants you to think he does, so you'll work hard at it. Preposterous! The right Deku scrub cried out. This is the palace of the Deku Kingdom. Only those on official business may enter. Seriously, the other said. Don't you think there's more to life than just being a god and greeting commoners? Imagine if we could travel the world. Every day, something new and exciting. Beautiful, gorgeous views. Breathtaking battles. Romantic nights with your one true love. The one somewhere out there meant for you. There is no time for such foolishness, the Deku scrub persisted. Our lives are indebted to our king, and we must serve our great leader by guarding this entrance. What if our king really isn't all that great, the other Deku scrub said, carefully watching his companion's reaction. The right Deku scrub gasped dramatically. <gasps> How could you say something so blasphemous? He screamed. Our leader is great, and you have no right to question him. He turned back to the sky. This is the palace of the Deku Kingdom. Only those on official business may enter. This is the palace of the Deku Kingdom. Only those on official business may enter. This is the palace of the... <laughs> the Deku scrub was cut short, however, when a thump violently ejected him from the flower. He wailed the whole way, arcing through the air and crashing into purple water. The one on the left looked dumbfounded, turning to find a small Deku scrub with blonde hair. He ran over the now empty flower and onto the bridge. He carried a set of Deku pipes, presumably what he'd stopped to hit his companion with. A small white fairy followed him. So, that didn't turn out the way we hoped? Tattle said. Link found it very difficult to run effectively with the Deku pipes, constantly trying not to trip. The king's unconscious, the monkey's still in his cage, and we left a few guards incapacitated. All a part of your cherished tactic of improvisation? Uh, this thing is getting heavy. <sighs> Link said, breathing hard. He stopped running just short of the wooden doorway leading to the boat dock. Well, don't stop now! Tattle exclaimed, turning to see the remaining Deku guard run back into the palace. We'll have hundreds of guards on us in a few seconds! We're not going that way! Link said, pointing towards a small piece of land with a Deku flower, not far from the bridge. It was against the same rock wall as the dock's doorway, a cave formed another passageway higher up. I think the butler said that would take us to the temple. 
You know, I specifically recall making only two stipulations before we set out on this journey, and I'm pretty sure one of them was not going into the temple, Tattle said. The princess is in there, Tattle, Link said, struggling to set down the pipes. And let's let her pray in peace. I have no interest in joining her while she worships Deku gods. We're not going in there to worship Deku gods, Link said, shaking his head as he removed his mask and transformed into a human. The monkey said there was a monster there. An even better reason not to go, Tattle said. Link reached down and picked up the Deku pipes, which were much lighter for his human arms. We can't let her die, Link repeated, returning the Deku mask over his face. His Deku pipes disappeared with his human form. How many times do I have to remind you that anything we do in this three-day cycle means absolutely nothing? Tattle asked. You won't change my mind, Link answered, hopping across the purple water to the piece of land with the Deku flower. <laughs> if we don't save her, she'll die, even if we leave this three-day cycle behind. Tattle opened her mouth to point out that the moon would kill everyone anyways, but when Link turned to face her, his bright orange eyes were still filled with determination. She thought better of it and merely sighed again, joining him across the water. <sighs> then come on, Link, Tattle said. Let's get this over with before it's too late. Link smiled, diving into the flower and shooting himself up to the cave. On the other side, they stepped onto a grassy ledge, walking a few feet further onto a squishy surface, a red, mushroom-topped tree growing tall from the water. There were other red trees, all close enough to jump from one to the other, curving along the poisoned swamp water. We can use the trees like stepping stones, Link suggested, deciding whether the next tree was too far away to jump. Yeah, and then you can slip and drown! Tattle said. It's not that far away, Link said. Yeah, but it's still... The Deku scrub leapt toward the next treetop before she could finish. Link! A few moments airborne ended when he landed safely on the next mushroom, barely stumbling. He regained his balance and walked to the next one. She eventually overcame her shock to rejoin him. Huh. <sighs> Don't do that again! And by that, I mean doing something stupid and dangerous before I can finish telling you how stupid and dangerous it is! Link scoffed, backing up and leaping to the next tree as Tattle held her breath. <sighs> he barely missed it, slipping along its surface only to roll off. Thankfully, he grabbed its edge before he plummeted to a watery grave. By the time Tattle joined him, he was already standing on top of the tree. There wasn't another mushroom tree close enough to jump to, but a large fallen tree trunk sloped downward to form a bridge. Link stepped onto the soggy, saturated bark, following it to a rock wall bordering the river. This seems like a lot of work, Tattle said. You'd think there'd be an easier way to get to the temple. Maybe there is. Link reasoned. We're trying to get there secretly, though, remember? Still, the fairy said, as Link hopped from the cliff to another red-topped tree. They could have planted Deku flowers on the trees. Wouldn't that have made it easier? Then it wouldn't be as secretive, Link replied, crossing to another one. He finally reached the edge of this stretch of the purple stream and rounded the rock barrier's corner. To the right, the swamp water led into another cave. Tattle realized this was where the loop completed. Coma's tour center would be on the other side. To the left, there were two massive pillars running the entire length of a rock face. In between them, a waterfall of poisoned swamp cascaded into the stream. Both pillars had a ledge perched high, separated by the powerful falls. One housed another cavern entrance. The Deku flower at Link's feet 
would make it possible to reach it. Huh, so much for secretive, Tattle mocked, smiling down at Link. You'd have to be blind and deaf to miss the massive waterfall. Let's just go through the doorway, Link replied dismissively, diving into the flower, hopping out, and using the rotating flowers to reach the ledge. He passed through the cavern entrance to find a new enclosed area similar to the Deku Palace. It was a basin surrounded by rocky cliffs and filled with purple water. The lake's only exit was the waterfall just beside Link. He stepped onto the only piece of land in the entire vast sea of violet. A network of wooden bridges and slopes started at Link's right slowly curving up and around until they reached the opposite side of the lake. There were no buildings, just empty purple water. Two dead thick trees had their tops sticking out of the lake, but other than that, only lily pads and moss floated along the surface. Great temple, Tattle finally said sarcastically. But Dret! No princess! Guess we'd better go get Koma and Kotake and play the Song of Time, hmm? Link looked up at her with obvious irritation. We can still follow the bridges up to that wooden thing on the other side. You mean that empty platform? Tattle asked. There's nothing on it. From here, it doesn't look like it. Link said, skipping across the water surface to the first wooden ramp. We have enough time to check it out. Tattle joined him as he followed the pathways around. I think the moon and sun disagree, she said, looking up. The massive, threatening face of gray rock suggested that the final night would soon arrive. The sun, which still vividly colored the sky, was well over halfway through its descent. It'll only take a couple of minutes, Link countered. Obviously, Tattle said, but let's say you find something on that platform we're headed toward. Then I'll figure out what to do within a couple of hours. <sighs> of course you will. The journey across the edge of the lake was a short one. Tattle noticed yet another massive cave on the far rock wall. It was larger than all the previous ones. When the Deku scrub and fairy stepped onto the deck held up by ancient wooden legs, they found a Deku flower. There were four poles at each corner of the wooden square. Colorful banners were strung between them. In the center sat a round, raised pedestal with a painted image of a Deku scrub. Tattle watched Link examine the platform with growing dismay, as if his hopes were dashed. The fairy decided to search herself, flying down to the pedestal and looking carefully at the painting. I wonder if they worshipped here, Tattle suggested. On this platform? Sure, it's all decorated and stuff. But the princess isn't here, Link commented, looking around the wooden surface one more time. Maybe she's in that cave, the fairy theorized looking behind them. On the cliff wall, a dark hole's depths were veiled in darkness. Link perked up immediately and turned to Tattle. What? she asked. Will you go in there for me? Link asked, trying his best to look as helpless as possible. Why? she said. There's a tiku flower right there, lazy bones! You can eat! <sighs> All right, fine! Tattle gave in, sighing as she flew across the water and into the cave. Link found the empty lake oddly disquieting by himself, so he examined the colorful pedestal while he waited for Tattle. What purpose could this platform have? He wondered. Suddenly, the monkey's advice returned to him. You have to be a member of the royal family to go in after her, but, okay, okay. I guess all you need is one of the royal family's instruments to do it. And then you have to know the song. <laughs> and be a Deku scrub. Link grabbed the edges of his Deku face until the mask came free and his human form returned. The Deku pipes clattered to the wooden planks. 
He then reapplied the mask and wrestled the instrument over his large Deku head. Eventually, the pipes rested on his shoulders neatly, and the five bells flared out around his head. The mouthpiece was just in front of his snout. The Deku scrub blew and was horrified by the noises that came out. Changing the valves didn't seem to make much of a difference. Tattle flew out of the cave moments later, returning to his side. Link! This great fairy is shattered too! Uh, I... Link? She stopped short when she saw him standing on the pedestal, making disgusting sounds on the Deku pipes. What are you doing? Link took his face away from the mouthpiece. Playing the instrument! He continued experimenting with his embouchure and airspeed, but as far as Tattle was concerned, the sound hardly varied. I can see that, she said, flying in front of him, and can unfortunately hear it. Link didn't respond. Are you trying to summon Deku gods? Something tells me they couldn't help us, even if they were real. How do you know they aren't real? Link asked. Because... Uh... Tattle trailed off, considering the matter as Link blared in the background. Well, I... Guess I don't. But that's not the point. I highly doubt you're trying to summon Deku deities. What are you trying to do? Link signed, taking the mouthpiece from his snout yet again. The monkey said you had to play that sonata to enter the palace. That's what I'm doing. How will playing a song get us into a temple that doesn't exist? Tattle asked. When the monkey said that, I was thinking more along the lines of a guard that would let us in as soon as he heard the song. Songs can't physically do anything. What about the song of time? Link asked. Tattle shook her head. Hyrule must be a really magical place, Link. Before you came into my life, there were no magic songs or transformation masks or time travel or super beans or anything, really. Wow. My life must have been pretty boring. She stopped talking when she realized Link wasn't listening. How long are you planning on making terrible music? There was no response, and Tattle looked once more at the sun and moon. <sighs> Hopefully not too long, Deku Head. As time passed, the Deku pipes never sounded any better. Tattle floated aimlessly around the platform in silent boredom. The sun shone fiercely through the clear sky, growing ever closer toward the horizon. Orange darkened into red. The moon remained above everything, hard and cold, bearing down on a world it sought to crush with gritted teeth. Eventually, moseying around in circles became tedious, and Tattle laid down on the planks, the blaring horn growing ever more distant as she lay there. Each blink became heavier than the last, and the sky darkened with her consciousness. The Deku pipes faded into her rambling mind. She wondered when Link would stop, wishing beyond anything that he would listen to her and play it safe. I hear you, sis, Tail said. The purple fairy flew by Tattle's side as they ventured across Termina Field. <sighs> He's so in sometimes, Tattle exclaimed. We argue with each other just as much as we used to. I missed you, Tattle, he confessed. The Skull Kid scares me now. Ever since he found that mask, I don't think he's been the same person anymore. I hear you, Tattle agreed. We need to find the four before it's too late. We can't keep going back in time forever. We should go to the border of Termina first, Link persisted, his dark blue eyes eager as he sprinted through dense tree after tree. Hey, Link, I don't know if this is a good idea, Tattle warned, trying to keep up. What's the worst that could happen? Link asked. We'll be fine. If anything bad happens, the ocarina will save us. Fire. We have to spend our time 
looking for the floor! Tattle reminded him, not flying fast enough to catch him. Must burn. We have an infinite amount of time, Tattle! Link reminded her from somewhere far ahead in the forest. The ocarina will save us! <sighs> they all die. But what if you lose it? The white fairy asked, losing sight of him. <sighs> what if it stops working? What if the skull kid finds us? Every time you play the song. And then... Link and Tattle stood side by side at the edge of the forest, looking out at a colorful, magnificent field of flowers. The wondrous sight rolled into the sunset as far as the eye could see. There was nothing to taint its beauty or undermine its grace. Come on, Tattle! It's amazing! Link exclaimed, smiling broadly as he gestured to the endless field. <sighs> it is! Isn't it? Tattle asked. She found her skepticism hard to ignore, though. But things shouldn't be this pretty outside of Termina. S something's wrong. We should go back. The border isn't safe. Why? Link asked, turning back to the flowers. Hyrule has to be out there somewhere. No, he won't be able to find it. Tattle pleaded. Please, Link! There's something very wrong about this place! It scares me! You can't be scared of the unknown, Tattle! Link replied, stepping into the flowers. Link! Link? No! The flowers melted away into darkness. The sky was black, and lightning rolled across the empty field of death. Everything shook. Termina is darkness! She heard Link yell, but from where, she couldn't tell. Link! Where are you? She asked, lost and scared. Termina is death. I can't see! And it is my child. The ground shook, and suddenly, Tattle's eyes shot open. She leapt from the platform, gasping as she caught her breath. She spun around to take in her surroundings as the dream faded. The first thing she noticed was the sky, which was not yet black, but darker than before. The sun bled into the horizon, threatening to slip away for good. How long was I asleep? She saw Link still standing on the pedestal. The mouthpiece, however, was no longer in his mouth, and the small blonde Tiku scrub stared with wide orange eyes at something behind her. The ground's still shaking, Tattle realized. She turned around to find its source. The entire bowl of rock holding the purple lake trembled, and in the center, the poisoned liquid rose, forming a small hill. The water surrounding it followed suit as the shaking escalated to an earthquake. Something massive is coming out of there, she realized. The two dead trees were simply on top of it. The horned mound of purple water continued to rise, filling the empty lake. Water fell from the hidden object, revealing a building. The temple. The stone construction had floor after floor disappearing into the water. Its true height was unknown. The portion sticking out of the water was tall, and a ledge ran around it at the halfway point. It was almost level with the wooden platform, several feet away despite its large size. The ledge sat below a doorway on the temple, and Tattle realized the Deku flower wasn't used only for reaching the fairy fountain behind them. Link and Tattle stood dumbfounded for a moment, each staring in awe at the temple that had risen from the water. I think that might be Woodfall, Link said after a moment of silence. <sighs> yeah, Tattle said, still dazed. You okay? Link asked. 
I'm fine, she lied. I just had a bad dream. Well, Link began, I know how much you love temples. If we go in there, you'll probably feel better. Shut up, Link, Tattle replied. I'll meet you by the doorway. Link stepped from the pedestal to the Deku flower, but he stopped when he realized the Deku pipes were still around him. Tattle watched him silently deliberate, and then he slid the instrument off and left it on the pedestal. He dove into the flower, shot out, and rode the flowers to the temple's ledge. For a moment, she thought he wouldn't make it, but he kicked furiously and barely landed with both feet on the cold, dark surface. Tattle and Link stood together before the darkness of the temple, both appearing hesitant to enter. "'Are you sure you want to do this?' Tattle asked, turning to her Deku scrub companion. "'If there's a chance that the princess is in there,' Link began. "'Yes!' The fairy looked at the sun. In several minutes, it would completely set. "'I'd say we only have twelve hours until the next sunrise!' That's when it falls, right? The Skull Kid sped it up both times I was on the clock tower, Link replied. But I don't think he will if we don't go up there. Well, to play it safe, we should get out of there by midnight, all right? Link nodded, stepping inside as his fairy lit the way. Link couldn't see anything outside of Tattle's soft white glow. The temple's first room was a pitch-black cave. Even if it were noon, Link didn't think the sun would reach five feet through the doorway. The entrance chamber's true width and height were hidden, but he wagered it was enormous. Link made his way carefully through the cold, damp air. He watched his feet, small stretches of stone illuminated by his fairy. This is really creepy, Tattle whispered. They huddled closely as they walked, her voice echoed across the vast, hidden room. Link almost didn't notice when the floor ended. He stopped just before stepping off the last stone, whose jagged edges met with a massive black pit. Link and Tattle traveled along its ledge, trying to find some trail that wrapped around the chasm's edges. There wasn't one. The floor stopped the entire length of the room. The only helpful discovery was a withered Deku flower on their side. Oh, what a bummer, Tattle said. I guess we have to leave now. I could use this to get across, Link suggested, hoping the pathetic planet still worked. Are you crazy? Tattle snapped. You might as well leap off the edge and hope there's a gigantic pillow at the bottom. We have to try. No, we don't! That tiki flower is ancient. We have no idea how big across this hole is. It could go on for miles! Why don't you fly across and see? Link asked, looking up from the flower. His fairy was a brilliant spotlight in the darkness. By myself? Tattle asked, turning to face the gaping black doom. <sighs> Fine! Man, the things I do for you! She tentatively floated off the floor, now suspended over emptiness. Eventually, she came back to report her findings. <sighs> there is another side, and the Deku flower might be able to take you that far. Maybe, if you really want to try this. Thanks, Tattle, Link said, still whispering. Can you light the way? The fairy agreed, returning to his side as he hesitantly stepped up to the flower. He took a deep breath, and then he dove within. That satisfying, biological release wasn't as strong as usual, but Link didn't care as long as it helped him across the gap. He sprung from its depths and brought two flowers with him. Tattle lit the darkness below him as his petals opened to rotate and carry him. Link directed himself across the hole, trying to stifle his anxiety. He watched the fairy illuminate only blackness as he traveled. The floor still had it reappeared. Link kept his focus on the unknown, waiting for that first hint of stone. Before it came, a noise greeted him, an insect-like buzzing. It lasted only a second before fading. 
Uh, what the din was that? The flying Deku scrub searched, but he found only shadows in each direction. Tattle's light and his own steady breathing were his singular breaks from nothingness. Soon, the noise returned, and this time, it didn't stop. It grew louder, heading straight for him. He noticed Tattle stop below and turned to find its source. He was instantly face to face with bright yellow eyes. His gasp instinctively turned to a green bubble, flying flat and uncharged from his snout. His arm seized in pain when something sharp stabbed him. His muscles tightened, and his fingers opened against his control. He watched the flower spiral from his injured hand. Link spun downward as all his weight was now on the remaining flower. The yellow eyes of his attacker vanished behind green goop, and the buzzing noises turned to shrieks. The Deku scrub squeezed his eyes shut as he clung to the only thing keeping him from freefall. His right arm remained limp and knotted in pain, dangling uselessly. The petals didn't last, folding in quickly from his weight. Link plummeted. He landed halfway on cold stone, though his legs landed over empty air. Link's torso almost slid off, but he grabbed the floor with his remaining hand. There were no notches or footholds, though, and one arm wasn't enough to save him. He slid along the slick ground toward death. Tattle appeared, grabbing onto him and pulling. Come on! The fairy exclaimed, though her small body accomplished little. The creature landed only a few feet beside him. It was wrapped in the gooey cocoon of green from Link's snout. Its tangled wings had only just barely saved itself from the pit. It tossed and turned as Link struggled too. The beast's yellow eyes were angry and glaring as one long slender tail stuck out. The tail's sharp end glistened, a stinger surely responsible for Link's paralyzed arm. Come on! Tattle screamed at Link, still pulling. His right arm refused to waken, and his left hand continued sliding closer to the lip. Only his left arm remained outstretched above him, barely holding on. He was surprised when his fairy abandoned her pulling, flying directly into his face. What is she doing? He thought. He felt her small hands running along his wood-like cheeks, as if searching. And then he understood. With only seconds left, he concentrated on entering the mindset he always did when removing the mask. He had to fight against the adrenaline, against the shrieking creature, against the pain in his right arm, and against his weakening left fingers, all to enter a serene state of calm. Mercifully, the mask came free. Link's human arms returned, and they both worked! He pulled himself out of the ditch immediately, now standing beside Tattle and panting. As he opened his mouth to speak, the furious buzzing sounded at their side. Get down! Tattle shrieked. Link dropped, rolling further from the pit as he drew his sword and returned to his feet. The glistening stinger just missed his head, and he saw the monstrous dragonfly clearly for the first time. Though it now stood, its wings were still damp and useless. Only the stinger swished, threatening above orange eyes. The creature dove outside Tattle's radius of light back into darkness. Link squinted, blindly searching the shadows for its next attack. The fairy seemed to notice she was doing more harm than good, so she flew to the dragonfly instead to illuminate it. He saw the monster just as it swung its tail again. Link's blade met it, and the stinger's end spun off, spraying thin yellow blood as it howled in pain. The dragonfly, even then, didn't relent, its orange eyes glaring angrily behind another charge. Link's sword was still at the ready, and its face caved easily beneath his weapon's pointed end. Link pulled his sword free as the dragonfly collapsed to its death. He eyed the yellow innards now coating his blade. More buzzing came from the pit as Tattle returned to him. That's way more than one, he realized. He backed slowly from the pit as Tattle echoed his concern. Link? He took the Tiku mask from his fairy, returned it to his bag, and ran from the pit and the dead dragonfly. Make sure there aren't more holes! 
Link screamed, still only able to see stretches of floor immediately before him. Tattle flew low, cautioning him to stop when they reached the room's opposite wall. Link turned from the dead end to see hundreds of yellow eyes in the darkness. He spun back, scanning with his fairy for the doorway out. Eventually they found it, and Link ran his hands along a thick stone slab and searched for a handle. There wasn't one. Uh, how am I supposed to open this? Link exclaimed, dropping his sword to use both hands to find some lever or trick. Don't look at me! Tattle exclaimed in awe before the swarm of dragonflies approaching. Just do something! <laughs> Pushing in on the door, he heard something budge, and he pulled the heavy door upward. It took almost... All of his strength, he could feel the flying creature stop right behind them, making a circle to trap them against the wall. Light poured in from beneath the door as it cracked open, and Link brought both hands to the bottom lip. He lifted the entire door and slid it upward. Still holding it up, he kicked his sword into the next room and allowed Tattle to fly in. As he lowered himself through, his left leg seized in a familiar, terrible pain. Link gasped, ignoring it as he rolled under the door. The heavy stone slab shut back into place. The stinger was still within his leg, however, and the door severed the monster's tail. The dragonfly's screech was barely audible from the other side. Link collapsed, his left leg now as useless as his Deku Scrub's right arm. He blinked dazedly at the change of light, scooting into the wall to sit up. The ceiling towered high above their heads, even from the raised balcony they found themselves on. A ramp at their side led down to the lower half of the room. The main feature, however, was what the balcony, ramp, and everything else in the room circled around. A massive, bulbous plant. It rose from the deep purple water. Its many revolting violet flowers hung off as it went straight into the ceiling. It didn't stop there, but continued to grow up against the roof. Purple ooze trickled from its gigantic body. The whole thing was probably 50 feet in diameter, though much taller. The plant had cracked through the stone top, letting sunlight pass. Link turned back to his leg once he had determined there were no enemies. The large stinger protruded from red, swollen skin. Every muscle was on fire. Link reached for the stinger tentatively, gritting his teeth as soon as he touched it. Tattle flew down to see herself. <sighs> Want me to pull it out? <clears throat> no! Link exclaimed, batting her away. I can do it! Tattle smiled, looking way too amused with herself. <laughs> Are you sure? Looking at it won't accomplish anything. Uh, I'm... Preparing myself, Link said, hesitantly bringing his hand toward it again. Really? Because it looks more like you're afraid. I'm not afraid, Link exclaimed, shooing her away again. Fine, whatever. Tattle turned back to examine the massive plant dominating the room. She flew off to the balcony's end, peering over to see the behemoth's roots. They disappeared into the dark, thick water, likely responsible for the foul smell that only grew. Ah, that stench! Uh, this place stinks, just like that poison swamp. Uh. Tattle thought about that for a minute before turning back to Link. I wonder if... Wait, seriously, Link? You still haven't pulled it out? Link didn't respond, staring intently at his wound. <sighs> I'm trying, all right. It's just like, ow! Tattle grabbed it before he could bat her away again, discarding the monster's limb over the balcony. Link's breath left him as he grabbed the open wound, clenching its teeth as it burned. Uh, why? Link whined. <sighs> because you wouldn't, Tattle said smugly. And remember, we're almost out of time. How long until you're walking again? Uh, I don't know, Link said, looking at the leg in dismay. He reached into his bag and pulled out the bottle of water. 
After taking a drink, he tilted his leg to flush out his wound with what little remained. The Tiku skin on your arm seemed to be a lot less irritated, Tattle commented. I don't think this swamp is very human-friendly in general, he replied as he recorked the now empty bottle to return to his bag. Maybe you should put your Tiku mask on, Tattle suggested. That way, you can at least walk. Link nodded and reapplied the mask to become the blonde-headed scrub again. He had his legs, but his right arm remained stiff. He could move it only slightly, and it hurt tremendously. The effects had started to wear off, but Link still held his injured arm close, bringing it across his chest. So, what's the plan? Tattle asked. We should find another way out of here before braving that massive pit of dragonflies again, and then also look for this princess you're obsessing over. I'm not obsessing, Link said. There's a monster that kidnapped her, remember? All right, Tattle said, eyeing the giant purple plant suspiciously. I guess we'll have to look out for that, too. Link nodded gravely, turning to walk down the ramp. Did we ever get a description for this monster? Tattle asked. Because monster is a pretty broad term. There's no telling what it could be, especially when we're in a massive temple that was buried in the middle of a poisonous swamp. Link shrugged, still cradling his right arm as they descended. Do you think it's a giant dragonfly? Like the queen of the hive? Or maybe it's an evil monkey. That would explain a lot. Link didn't dignify that with a response. The ramp leveled out onto a platform just above the poisonous water. Another heavy stone door blocked the way onward. Link sighed, realizing his Deku arms couldn't lift that, especially now that he had only one. That's going to get annoying really quickly, isn't it? Tattle commented as Link removed his mask and collapsed to the floor with his injured leg. Upon opening the door and crawling inside, he became a Deku scrub again. The next room was much smaller and still made entirely of stone, but they were once again in absolute darkness. Tattle lit its contents. They were messy, crumbled papers scattered along the floor. Deku Link eyed them curiously as he stepped in, keeping his ears open for buzzing. He stayed close to Tattle since he was blind otherwise. She passed a doorway on the left that revealed a long, dark passageway, but she ignored that in favor of something else. Look, she said. Link turned from the hallway but only found a blank wall at first. When she illuminated something lower, he jumped back in surprise when he realized it was a skeleton. The deceased Deku scrub lay against the wall, garbed in what resembled armor. Its helmet lay discarded alongside a thick club. The dry, caked dust revealed its age. Link's eyes found an old quiver on its shoulder and noticed the fletched ends of arrows protruding outward. A bow in surprisingly decent condition lay beside it. When Tattle's light left, the bow vanished. Hey! Link whispered. What? She asked, turning back. He had a bow. Link explained, as Tattle illuminated the deceased Deku Scrub's corpse again. I bet it doesn't even work. She lit the way nonetheless, as Link pulled the leather strap from its shoulder. The skeleton fell over, but remained mostly intact. Link sat against the wall as he examined the weapon. Well? Tattle asked softly. Link ran his hands along the string, finding it still tight. Only a chip or two were missing from the upper and lower limbs. The grip had been worn, but the bow, with its jet black string and golden wood, would work. I think I found a winner, he said, smiling as he examined the arrows in the quiver. But you have the bubble things when you're a Tiku scrub, Tattle reminded him. Do you really have to carry that around? I've always carried a bow. Link explained, setting any of the arrows that had missing heads or snapped stems aside. I lost mine chasing the Skull Kid, but it'd be nice to have one again. Besides, I don't feel all that safe when I'm a Deku Scrub. 
I'd like to fight dragonflies without my mask. Well, don't go forgetting how unfriendly this swamp is to humans. It's not all that friendly to Deku Scrubs either. Link added, scooting himself into a more comfortable position. He removed his mask and flexed the toes in his injured leg, which already was feeling better. Especially in dark, narrow hallways, like that one we're about to go through. Well, whatever form you decide on, we'd better get moving quickly. Remember the moon? We don't even have a way out of here yet. We have the ocarina, Link reminded her, if it comes to that. But then we'd leave the witches behind, the fairy exclaimed. We need them if we ever want to take on the Skull Kid. For the millionth time, we don't have to worry about him right now, Link reassured her. He's still stuck in the three-day loop. He's probably floating above the clock tower waiting for us, tossing the ocarina up and down in his... Link stopped, though, realizing something for the first time. Tattle didn't even have to ask. She watched, lighting his way as Link pulled the ocarina from his belt's pouch. He furrowed his brow at the black mark still burnt into the blue surface. Do you think he notices a difference? Tattle asked, reading Link's mind. Or are there now two ocarinas? No, there aren't two, Link said certainly. When I went up there the second time, he didn't have one right before he... Tried to kill you? Tattle finished. When Link still didn't say anything, the fairy pressed on. Link, did he try to kill you the first time? That time when I... Er, the old me died? Link didn't answer again, staring at his ocarina's mark. He eventually shook his head. Tattle gulped. Do you think... No! Link said immediately, stuffing the ocarina into his bag without much thought. He managed to stand, steadying himself against the wall and putting most of the weight on his other leg. And it wouldn't matter anyway, because his memory would get wiped every time I play the song. Are you sure? Tattle asked as Link stowed the bow, quiver, and mask away in his bag. I'm pretty sure neither of us knows the ins and outs of this whole time travel business. I've only done it twice, and I think you've only done it once more. He didn't realize... I'd gone back in time, remember? Link stated, using the wall as support as he walked toward the hallway. His limp wasn't as bad as he thought, and he still felt safer than he would be as a one-armed Deku scrub. It's not... Possible, Tattle. He's not in the cycles the same way we are. I don't think you understand how powerful this ocarina is. And I think you're underestimating how powerful the Skull Kid is, Tattle retorted. We can't keep hiding in three-day cycles forever. Yes, we can, Link said, though he realized how stubborn that sounded. <sighs> That's not what I meant. As long as we need to, we can. Like I said, everyone forgets everything that happened every time I play it. I still remember, Tattle pointed out. But that's only because you were with me when I play it. You definitely didn't remember anything after you died. I didn't die. And that's exactly the point I'm trying to make! Link exclaimed, rounding the corner to face the passageway's depths. It never happened. We get a clean slate each time. Tabula rasa. Tabula what -a? Tattle asked. It means a blank slate. You know, a fresh start. Tattle didn't seem impressed. <sighs> Whatever, Link. We do need a plan. Eventually. Save the princess? Find one of the four? Link asked. Sure, the fairy said. And I guess the next step in that is to go down this creepy hallway. Are you ready to get attacked and almost eaten again? Of course, Link replied, still leaning against one of the walls as he walked. His head almost touched the ceiling, and there was hardly any room from side to side. Tattle followed closely, venturing in silence. There was no end in sight, and the room behind them had already disappeared, their ears remained open and acute, listening for any signs of movement and speech. 
Only Link's shuffling boots and breathing made it through. Occasionally, his foot would get caught in thick roots growing between the cracks on the floor. And so the silence continued, neither one daring to speak as they progressed. Link didn't stop until one particular step made a clicking sound. He quickly looked down, but he was too late. The floor fell out from under him. <gasps> Link gasped, attempting to retract his foot, but the other leg was still not strong enough to hold him. He stumbled forward, falling onto his face and rolling with the floor, now swinging down on heavy stone hinges. Link tried to grab a hold of anything, but his hands only met either smooth stone or roots too small to cling to. He stopped rolling only briefly when his bag caught on one of the roots. Link in that moment noticed Tattle flying towards him. Then his arm slid from the shoulder strap. His bag remained caught on the root as he rolled into the dark hole. Tattle narrowly made it through the floor's opening to join him as it rose back into place, sealing itself shut as if nothing had happened. Link's fall was short, ending on a stone surface covered in plant life. Link scrambled to sit up as Tattle joined him. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, I'm fine, Link said, using the wall as support. He caught his breath as he examined the new dark room. His eyes followed Tattle as she lit it up, though she was unable to fly far. The room was a small box. There were no doorways or openings of any kind along the walls, floor, and ceiling. It was just a dark stone rectangle. The floor above them had blocked off the hallway completely. Link's expression grew darker when Tattle ventured near the floor and found two or three more Deku scrub skeletons. Each was dressed in armor and adorned with random broken weapons. It was a trap, Link said, staring off into the distance. Huh, you think? She flew against the ceiling, pushing into it with all her weight. It won't budge! No, uh, Tattle, we're trapped, Link repeated. Uh, we've already established that, genius! When Tattle heard Link struggling behind her, she turned to see his shield in hand, which he flung forcefully at the ceiling. It bounced back to the stone floor uselessly. Link hardly seemed to notice, pulling his scabbard off next. He tossed that angrily at the ceiling too, sword still sheathed. Link! Tattle exclaimed. The sheathed sword clanged to the ground, but Link didn't acknowledge her. Instead, he threw his hat next, which didn't even reach the ceiling before fluttering back down. He stumbled into a sitting position up against the wall, holding his blonde hair in his hands as he squeezed his eyes shut. Link! Tattle repeated, flying closer. My bag's up there too, Link finally said after several moments, bringing down his shaking hands. I'm sorry, Link, Tattle said. I don't think there's any way we can get it. <sighs> My ocarina is in it. The fairy didn't comprehend at first, shaking her head. What are you talking about? You always keep it on your belt, remember? <sighs> I accidentally put it in the bag, Link said, staring grimly across their small, dark prison. We're trapped in here, Tattle. You were right. The ocarina can't save us. The moon's going to come crashing down at the end of the night, and we can't do anything about it.